but haste, and summon to our courts above the Azure Queen. Let her persuasion move her furious son from Priam to receive the proffered ransom, and the course to leave. Between where Sam is wide his forest spreads, and rocky Imbrus lifts its pointed heads, down plunged the maid. The parted waves resound, she plunged and instant shot the dark, as bearing death in the fallacious bait, from the bent angle sinks the leading weight. So passed the goddess through the closing wave, where that is sorrowed in her secret cave. Then thus the goddess of the painted bow, Arise, O Thetis, from thy seats below, tis Jove that calls. And why, the dame replies, calls Jove his then. Then, through the world of waters they repair, the way fair Iris led to upper air. The deeps dividing, o'er the coast they rise, and touch with momentary flight the skies. There in the lightning's blaze the sire they found, and all the gods in shining synod round. The tis approached with anguish in her face, Minerva rising gave the mourner place. Even Juno sought her sorrows to console, and offered from her hand the nectar bowl. Nine days are past since all the court above in Hector's cause have moved the ear of Jove. Twas voted, Herms from his godlike foe by stealth should bear him, but we will not so, then he be to him, and our mandate bear. Tell him he tempts the wrath of heaven too far, nor let him more, our anger if he dread, vent his Arrived, she heard the voice of loud lament, and a chewing groans that shook the lofty tent. His friends prepare the victim, and dispose repast. No longer then, his fury if thou dread, detain the relics of great Hector dead, nor vent on senseless earth thy vengeance vain, but yield to ransom. Alone the Ilian ramparts let him leave, and bear what sterner chills may receive. Alone, for so we will. No Trojan near except, to place the dead with decent, nor let him death, nor let him danger dread, safe through the foe by our protection led. Him harms to a chills shall convey guard of his life, and partner of his way. Fierce as he is, a chill's self shall spare his age, nor touch one venerable hair. Some thought there must be in a soul so brave, some sense of duty, some desire, and all amidst them lay the hoary sire, sad scene of woe. His face his rapt attire concealed from sight. With frantic hands he spread a shore of ashes o'er his neck. From room to room his pensive daughters roam whose shrieks and clamours fill the vaulted dumb. Mindful of those, who late their pride and joy lie pale and breathless, nor shalt thou death, nor shalt thou danger dread. Safe through the foe by his protection led, the harms to Polides shall convey guard of thy life and partner of thy way. Fierce as he is, a chill's self shall spare thy age, nor touch one venerable hair. Some thought there must be in a soul so brave some sense of duty, some desire to say. Priam bids prepare his gentle mules and harness to the car. There for the gifts a polished casket lay. His pious sons the king's command obey. Then passed the monarch to his bridal room, where cedar beams the lofty roof's perfume, and where the treasures of his empire lay. Then called his queen, and thus began to tell me thy thought. My heart impels to go through hostile camps, and bears me to the foe. The hoary monarch thus. Her piercing cries sad Hecuba renews, and then replies, Whither wanders thy distempered mind, and where the prudence now that odd man and ah, No pent in this sad palace, let us give to grief the wretched days we have to live. Still, still for Hector let our sorrows flow, born to his own, and to his parents' woe, doomed from the hour his luckless life begun, to do, had any mortal voice the injunction laid, nor augur priest, nor seer had been obeyed. A present goddess brought the high command, I saw, I heard her, and the word shall stand. I gave the gods a bee. To you, to you, to you, to you, to you. They say, the view, the view, the view, call.
What make ye here? Officious crowds, he cries. Hence, nor obtrude your anguish on my aids. Have ye no briefs at home to fix ye there? Am I the only object of despair? Am I become my people's common show? Set up by Jove your spectacle of woe. No, next on his sons his erring fury falls. Polites, Paris, Agathon, he calls. Threats Deophobus and Des here, inglorious sons of an unhappy sire, why did not all in Hector's cause expire? Wretch that I am, my bravest offspring slain. You, the disgrace of Priam's house, remain, Mester the brave, renowned in ranks of war, with Troilus, dreadful on his rushing car 293, and laugh, high on the seat the cabinet they bind, the new made car with solid beauty shined. Box was the yoke, embossed with costly pains, and hung with ringlets to receive. Then fixed a ring the running reins to guide, and close beneath the gathered ends were tied. Next with the gifts, the price of Hector slain, the sad attendants load the groaning wain. Last to the yoke the well-matched mules they bring, the gift of Mysia to the Trojan. While careful these the gentle coursers joined, said Hecuba approached with anxious mind, a golden bowl that foamed with fragrant wine, libation destined to the power, since victor of thy fears and slighting mine, heaven or thy soul, inspires this bold design. Pray to that God, who high on Ida's brow surveys, that sign beheld and strengthened from above. Boldly pursue the journey marked by Jove. But if the God his augury denies, suppress thy impulse, nor reject. If such thy will, dispatch from yonder sky thy sacred bird, celestial augury, let the strong sovereign of the plumy race tower on the right of yon ethereal space. Wide as appears some palace gate displayed, so broad, his pinions stretched their ample shade, as stooping dexter with resounding wings the imperial bird descends in airy rings. A dawn of joy in every face appears. The morning matron dries her timorous tears. Swift on his car the impatient monarch sprung, the brazen portal in his passage. On his slow wheels the following people wait, mourn at each step and give him up to fate. With hands uplifted eye him as he passed, and gaze upon him as they gazed their lap. Now forward fares the father on his way, through the lone fields, and back to Ilion they. Great Jove beheld him as he crossed the plain, and felt the woes of miserable man. Then thus to Hermes, Thou whose constant cares still succor mortals, and attend their prayers, behold an object to thy charge consigned, if ever pity touched thee for man, a beauty, the Hail, and be blessed, for scarce of mortal kind. Oft have these eyes that godlike Hector viewed in glorious fight, with Grecian blood imbrued. I saw him when, like Joe, his flames he tossed on thousand ship. For him I serve, of Myrmidonian race, one ship conveyed us from our native place. Polyctor is my sire, an honored name, old like thyself, and to watch this quarter my adventure falls. For with the morn the Greeks attack your walls. Sleepless they sit, impatient to engage, and scarce still as Aro's ruddy beam is spread, round his friend's Tom a chills drags the dead, yet undisfigured, or in limb or face, all fresh he lies, with some heavenly care, some hand divine, preserves him ever fair, or all the host of heaven, to whom he led a life so grateful, still regard him dead. But thou, generous youth, this goblet take, a pledge of gratitude for Hector's sake, and while the favoring gods our steps survey, safe to polite's tent conduct my way, but can I, absent from my prince's sight, take gifts in secret that must shun the light? What from our master's interest thus we draw? 
is but a licensed theft. Respecting him, my soul abjures the offense, and as the crime, I dread the consequence. Be far as Argos, pleased I could convey, guard of thy life and partner of thy way. On thee attend, thy safety to maintain, o'er pathless and now they reached the naval walls and found the guards repasting while the bulls go round on these the virtue of his wand he tries and pours deep slumber on their watch unseen through all the hostile camp they went and now approached pelide's lofty tent on furs the roof was raised and covered o oh, oh, with reeds collected from the marshy shore and fenced with palisades a hall of state the work of soldiers, this herms, such the power of gods, set wide. Then swift alighted the celestial guide, and thus revealed, Prince, and understand thou owest thy guidance. Now fearless enter, and prefer thy prayers. Adjure him. Evenbedu, as his father's silver hairs, his son, his mother, urge him to bestow, unseen by these, yet still one comfort in his soul may rise he hears his son still lives to glad his eyes and hearing still may hope a better day may send him thee to chase that foe away no comfort to my griefs no hopes remain the best the bravest of my sons are slain yet what a race ere greece to ilion came the pledge of many a him to thy rage has slain Beneath thy steel, unhappy in his country's cause, he fell. For him, then with his hand, as prostrate still he lay, the old man's cheek he gently turned away. Now each by turns indulged the gush of wool, and now the mingled tides together flow. This low on earth, that gently bending o'er, oh, oh, a father won. The infectious softness through the heroes ran. One universal solemn shower began. They bore as heroes, but they felt as men. Satiate at length with unavailing woes. From the high throne divine chills rose. The reverend monarch by the hand he raised. On his white beard and form majestic gaze. Rise, then. Let reason mitigate your care. To mourn avails not. Man is born to bear. Such is Alice, the gods' severe decree. They only they are blessed, and only free. Two urns by Jove's high throne have ever stood, the source of evil one, and one of good. From thence the cup of mortal man he fills, blessings to these, to those de The happiest taste not happiness sincere, but find the cordial draught is dashed with care who more than Peleus shone in wealth and power what stars concurring blessed his natal hour, a realm, a goddess to his wishes given, graced by the gods with all the gifts of heaven. One evil yet overtakes his latest day, no race succeeding to imperial sway, and only son, and he, Alice, ordained to fall untimely in a f See him in Troy, the pious care decline of his weak age, to live the curse of thine, thou too, old man, hast happier days beheld. In but since the god his hand has pleased to turn, and fill thy measure from his bitter urn, what sees the sun, but hapless heroes, falls, war, and the blood of men, bear thy lot, nor shed these unavailing sorrows over the dead. Thou canst not call him from the Stygian shore, but thou, Alice, mayst live to suffer more, to, oh, give me Hector, to my eyes restore his course, and take the gifts. I ask no more. Thou, as thou mayst, these boundless stores enjoy. Safe mayst thou sail, and turn thy wrath from troll. So shall thy pity and forbearance give a weak cease, lest, neglectful of high Jove's command, I show thee, king, Thou treadst on hostile land. Release my knees, thy suppliant arts give o'er. A chills, like a lion, rushed abroad. Automedon and Alcimus attend, whom most he honored. 
since he lost his friend, these two inyoke the two splendid mantles, and a carpet spread they leave, to cover and enwrap the dead. Then call the handmaids, with assisted toil to wash the body and anoint with oil, apart from Priam, lest the unhappy sire, provoked to passion, this done, the garments owe the course they spread. A chills lifts it to the funeral bed. Then, while the body on the car they laid, he groans, and calls on loved Patricia. The gifts the father gave, be ever thine, to grace thy manes, and adorn thy shrine two hundred ninety-six, he said, and, entering, took his seat of state. Where not thus did Niob, a form divine, apparent once, whose sorrows equalled thine, six youthful sons, as many blooming maids, in one steeped in their blood, and in the dust outspread, nine days, neglected, lay exposed the dead, none by to weep them, to inhume them none, for herself a rock, for such was heaven's high will, through deserts wild now pours a weeping rill, where round the bed whence Achilles springs, the watery fairies dance and make such griefs, O king, have other parents known, remember theirs, and mitigate thy own. The care of heaven thy Hector has appeared, nor shall he lie unwept, and e'en entered. Soon may thy aged cheeks in tears be drowned, and all the eyes of Ilion stream around. The limbs they sever from the reeking hide, with skill prepare them, and in parts divide. Each on the coals the separate morsels lays, and hasty snatches from the rising. With bread the glittering canisters they load, which round the board Automedon bestowed. The chief himself to each his portion placed, and each indulging shared in sweet repast. When now the rage of hunger was repressed, the wandering hero eyes his royal guest. No less the royal guest the hero eyes, his godlike aspect and majestic size. Thus gazing long, the silence neither broke, a solemn scene, at length the father spoke. Permit me now, beloved of Jove, to steep my careful temple. Then he, now, father, sleep, but sleep not here, consult thy safety, and forgive my fear, lest any argive, at this hour awake, to, should such report thy honored person here, the king of men the ransom might defer. But say with speed, if aught of thy desire remains unasked, what time the rites require to nine days to vent our sorrows I request. The tenth shall see the funeral and the feast. The next, to raise his monument be given. The twelfth we war, if we but in the porch the king and herald rest, sad dreams of care yet wandering in their breast. Now gods and men the gifts of sleep partake. Industrious Herms only was awake, the king's return revolving in his mind, to pass the ramparts, and the watch to blind. The power descending hovered o'er his head. And sleep'st thou, father, thus the vision said, Now dost thou sleep, when Hector is restored, Nor fear the gracious. When now to Xanthus' yellow stream they drove, Xanthus, immortal progeny of Jove, The winged deity forsook their view, And in a moment to Olympus flew. Now should Aurora round her saffron ray, sprang through the gates of light, and gave the day, charged with the mournful load, to Ilion go the sage and king majestically slow. Cassandra first beholds from Ilion's spire the sad procession of her hoary sire. Then, as the pensive pomp advanced more near, her briefless brother, at Skay's gates they meet the morning wane, hang on the wheels, and grovel round the slain. The wife and mother, frantic with despair, kiss his pale cheek, and rend their scattered hair, thus wildly wailing, at the gates they lay. And a melancholy chore attend around, with plaintive sighs, and music's solemn sound. Alternately they sing, alternate flow the obedient tears, melodious in their wool, while deeper sorrows groan from each full heart, and nature speaks at every pause of art. First to the course the weeping concert flew. Around his neck her milk-white arms she threw, and, oh, my Hector, oh, my lord, 
she cries, snatched in thy who now protects her wives with guardian care, who saves her infants from the rage of war. Now hostile fleets must waft those infants over. Why gavest thou not to me thy dying hand? And why received not I thy last command? Some word thou wouldst have spoke, which sadly dear my soul might keep, or utter with a tear. The mournful mother next sustains her part. O thou, the best, the dearest to my heart, of all my race thou most by heaven approved, and by the immortals even in death the sentenced, tis true, by his inhuman doom, thy noble course was dragged around the tomb, the tomb of him thy warlike arm had slain, ungenerous insult, impo said Helen next in pomp of grief appears. Fast from the shining sluices of her eyes fall the round crystal drops, while thus she cries, A dearest friend, in whom the gods had joined to, in hundred ninety-eight the mildest manners with the bravest mind, now twice ten years, unhappy years, are o'er since when others cursed the authoris of their woe, thy pity checked my sorrows in their flow. If some proud brother eyed me with disdain, or scornful sister with her sweeping train, thy gentle accents softened all my pain. For thee I mourn, and mourn myself in thee, the wretched source of all this misery, the fate I caused for ever I bemoan. Said Helen has no friend, now thou art gone, through Troy's wide streets abandoned shall I roam in Troy deserted, as a boarded distressful beauty melts each standard by. On all around the infectious sorrow grows, but Priam checked the torrent as it rose. Perform, ye Trojans, what the rites require, and fell the forests for a funeral. These toils continue nine succeeding days, and high in air a sylvan structure raise. But when the tenth fair morn began to shine, Forth to the pile was born the man divine, and placed aloft, while all, with streaming eyes, beheld the flames, and soon as our own daughter of the dawn, with rosy luster streaked the dewy lawn, again the mournful crowds surround the pyre, and quench with wine the yet remaining fire. The snowy bones his friends and brothers place, with tears collected, in a golden vase. The golden vase in purple palls they rolled of softest texture, and inwrought with last over the urn the sacred earth they spread, and raised the tomb, memorial of the dead. Strong guards and spies, till all the rites were done, watched from the rising to the setting sun. All Troy then moves to Priam's court again, a solemn silent, such honors Ilion to her hero paid, and peaceful slept the mighty Hector's shade three hundred concluding note. We have now passed through the Iliad, and seen the anger of a chills, and the terrible effects of it at an end, as that only was the subject of the poem, and the nature of epic poetry. I need not mention that Troy was taken soon after the death of Hector by the stratagem of the wooden horse, the particulars of which are described by Virgil in the second book of the Aeneid. A chills fell before Troy by the hand of Paris, by the shot of an arrow in his heel, as Hector had prophesied at his death. Lib. Phi. The unfortunate Priam was killed by Pyrhus, the son of a chills. Ajax, after the death of a chills, had a contest with Ulysses for the armor of Vulcan, but being defeated in his aim, he slew himself through indignation. Helen, after the death of Paris, married Dephobus his brother, and at the taking of Troy betrayed him, in order to reconcile herself to Menelaus her first husband, who Agamemnon at his return was barbarously murdered by Aegisthus, at the instigation of Clytemnestra his wife, who in his absence had dishonored his bed with Aegisthus. Diomed, after the fall of Troy, was expelled his own country and scarce escaped with his life from his adulterous wife Agil, but at last was received by Donus in Apulia. Nestor lived in peace with his children in Pylos, his native country. Ulysses also, after innumerable troubles by sea and land, at last returned in safety to Ithaca, which is the subject of Homer's Odyssey. For what remains, I beg to be excused from the ceremonies of taking leave at the end of my work. 
and from embarrassing myself or others with any defenses or apologies of but instead of endeavouring to raise a vain monument to myself of the merits or difficulties of it which must be left to the world to truth and to posterity let to him therefore having brought this long work to a conclusion i desire to dedicate it and to have the honour and satisfaction of placing together in this manner the congreve and of march twenty five seventeen twenty a Pope Tum Thi in Diu Poia. To me epa plan me procafe in poietic e ke alois epiteo e messi in ois isos a catis chifang. E est homen emot in you. Hm. Aurel anton de sipso. Lib. I. Seventeen. End of the Iliad footnotes one what? Says Archdeacon Wilberforce. The natural root of loyalty is distinguished from such somewhat similar may be seen in the disposition to idolize those great lawgivers of man's race who have given expression in the immortal language of song to the deeper inspirations of the thoughts of homer or of shakespeare are the universal inheritance of the human race in this mutual ground every man meets his brother they have been set forth by the providence of God to vindicate for all of us what nature could effect, and that, in these representatives of our race, nine, ten, two acres de min and came the motion of Panton Grafiste, vit, hum, instue, heroduct, t, If P two hundred ninety nine six. I may observe that this life has been paraphrased in English by my learned young friend Kenneth R. A. Mackenzie, and appended to my prose translation of the Odyssey. The present abridgment, however, will contain all that is of use to the reader, for the biographical value of the treatise is most insignificant. 3. i.e. both of composing and reciting verses, for as Blair observes, the first poets sang their own verses. Sextus Emperor Ad mus p three hundred sixty head fabric our mele g toy koi poete melopoio elegante k tau omro eep to pale pros lurin edito the voice observes herein was always accompanied by some instrument. The bard was provided with a harp on which he played a prelude to elevate and inspire his mind, and with which he accompanied the song when begun. His voice probably preserved a medium between singing and recitation. The words and not the melody were regarded by the listeners, hence it was necessary for him to remain intelligible to all. In countries where nothing similar is found, it is difficult to represent such scenes to the mind, but whoever has had an opportunity of listening to the improvisation of Italy can easily... 94. For should it not be since my arrival? Asks Mackenzie, observing that poplars can hardly live so long, but setting aside the fact that we must not expect consistency in a mere romance. The ancients had a superstitious belief in the great age of trees which grew near places consecrated by the presence of God. See Cicero de Legii sub in it, where he speaks of the plane tree under which Socrates used to walk, and of the tree at Delos, where Latona gave birth to Apollo. This passage is referred to by Stephanus of Byzantium. S. B. N. T. P three 
490. Ed. De I omit quoting any of the dull epigrams ascribed to Homer for, as Mr. 